This week's On The Ledge is supported by Hoppy, the home management website where you can save money on your household bills and find tradespeople for all those jobs around the home. Why not see how much time and money you can save today at hoppy.co.uk. That's hoppy.co.uk. Hello and welcome to On The Ledge podcast, episode 148, your one-stop shop for house plant chat. This week's show is a smackdown between two plant processes in part two of our Leaf Botany series. Botanist and On The Ledge listener, Dr. Polly Schiffman, is on hand to answer all your questions about what CAM crassulation acid metabolism and gutation actually are. So if you've heard those meet the listener questions and wondered what on earth I was talking about, this is the episode for you. Plus, I answer a question about beheading a Chinese money plant. And we hear from listener Joe in Texas, who will be answering that tricky question, cam versus gutation in Meet the Listener. And now it's time to sit down with a cup of your finest English builder's tea served in a Cornishware mug. Uh, Only Cornishware for me. If you're not aware of what the hell Cornishware is, then have a Google uh, or an Ecosia, I should say, and uh, you'll find out. Anyway, I'm I'm waffling now, but I want to talk to you about some reviews that I've had. Let me just... uh wet my whistle, as we say here in the UK. Uh, Right. So yes, four reviews have come in and they are delightfully varied in their content matter. We'll start at the bottom and we'll work up in terms of the pleasantness of these reviews. So the one that was the least flattering, but kind of made me laugh, actually, is entitled, If You Want to Talk Politics, At Least Get It Right. And the reviewer is called Why Are You Only On iTunes? I mean, I guess that's not a personal dig because On The Ledge is is on many pod apps. But anyway, so the Why Are You Only On iTunes said BLM, which I presume is short for Black Lives Matters, is a front, an organisation that funds white Democrats and uses black and minorities as its foot soldiers. Look deeper, Perone. Perone spelt incorrectly with one R. I am not going to honour your comment with any kind of response because it's so ridiculously out there and I just simply cannot trust somebody who cannot even get a surname spelled correctly. Interestingly, though, you did give the podcast three stars. I guess you're enjoying some other elements of the show. But thank you for your review. Had a lovely review from Maniki8 in the USA, whose title is Jane is Great, Love This Podcast. I wish I could pop in at her house and get some plant cuttings. Oh, that is so sweet. And yeah, I love uh, I love giving out the plant cuttings. But uh, if everybody who listens to the show comes around, it's going to get very crowded. So Yeah, maybe not on this occasion. (laughs) Uh, Also, new Pinterest user from the US is my newest fan, apparently. So thank you for your lovely review. And also, The Plant Rescuer says, my favourite podcast ever, Simply Obsessed. Thank you, Plant Rescuer. I think I know who you are. And you may be featuring in an upcoming show. I'm giving too much away here. Uh, Is that all of them? I think that's all of them, the most recent ones anyway. Have I read out J. Beck M's review? I'm in love with this show. Wonderful British humour paired with interesting plant information. I'm not sure. I can't remember. But if not, thank you, J. Beck M. And yeah, do go and leave a review for On The Ledge because all of your reviews make me smile, even the misspelt three-star ones. And it's a delight to read them. So thank you to everyone who has reviewed the show. Whether that was in March 
2017, just after the show started, or just last week. I appreciate all of your reviews. And don't forget to join Houseplant Fans of On The Ledge, our uber-friendly, welcoming Houseplant Fans group. For anyone who listens to the show, do answer all three questions because my moderators, they are tough cookies and they will not let you in unless you answer all three questions. But once you're in, it's a wonderful place to be with loads of helpful members who are ready to commiserate with your disasters, answer questions and generally share the houseplant love. It's Houseplant Fans of On The Ledge. You can just uh, search for it on Facebook and it is bound to pop up and you'll know exactly where you're going. Thanks to Sonia from Australia who sent an email in thanking me for the way I handled the criticism of the Black Lives Matters mention on the podcast. And I've had a few emails like that from people. So thank you very much for your support. Sonia also recommended the Plant ID app Euclid, E-U-C-L-I-D, for identifying Angophora, Corymbia and Eucalyptus. She writes... It really teaches you the importance of considering every aspect of a plant to get clues and positive ID. So do check out Euclid. I shall certainly be doing so. And thank you to Kristin for becoming a crazy plant person and for Christine, Amanda and Emily for becoming legends. They've all become patrons in the past week or so. Great to have you on board one and all. And if you're not quite sure what all this Patreon business is about, do check out the show notes at janeperone.com where all is explained. And if anything isn't explained, you can always just drop me a line and I will be happy to help. Just a reminder, there's no episodes running on July the 24th or the 31st because for the first time since February, I am taking a break from the show. It'll be my first days off in many months. So I'm really looking forward to that time. I'll be back with the show for episode 150 on August the 7th. And do keep coming forward for Meet the Listener. We are still looking for people to feature on the show. So if you are from a country or a region that has not yet been represented on Meet the Listener, then I'd particularly like to hear from you. All you need to do is drop an email to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com and my assistant Kelly, who takes care of Meet the Listener, will be in touch with full details of how to take part. It's really, really simple. You just need a smartphone and a voice. That's it. Let's start the show with question of the week, which comes from Tracy and it's a query about her Chinese money plant. It's now 24 inches tall. How much is that in centimeters? 24 times 2.5 is okay. <laughs> yeah. Brief break while I do some mental math. Yeah, 60 centimetres tall for those of us uh, in Europe who prefer metric. So Tracy wants to reduce the height of the plant without killing it off. Pilea peperomioides, or the Chinese money plant, does have a habit of doing this. When you get one from a friend or you buy one in the shop and it's cute and dinky and small, little do you know that this plant can actually get quite tall and lanky and then can end up toppling over. An interesting thing to note is that in nature, these plants do just that, where they grow in China, in Yunnan province. Once they get too tall, they do just flop over. And I guess that's one of the reasons why they root so easily, because you can then get baby plants growing from the stem, which can then root into the ground. The parent plant might get killed off or not. And you end up with a little forest of plants. But for those of us who want our Pilea peperomioides to look a little bit more ordered, what do we do? This is actually a question I'm facing with my own plant at the moment because it is getting quite tall. I haven't quite made the decision what to do yet. But my suggestion for Tracy was that either she kind of either let it flop or perhaps supported it with a cane or she went for the radical option, a beheading. This does sound rather serious, but it really does work for these plants. You can cut the top off a of Pilea peperomioides and then take off some of those lower leaves, pop that in either some water, 
or into some soil and it will root again fairly easily. And you get two for the price of one because the existing plant will also start shooting again from that top growth. So if your plant really doesn't look great and you just want to change it, that is a radical way of doing it. And it, it's pretty foolproof. It's hard to get that wrong. So yeah, I'd encourage you, if you're really unhappy with the shape of your pilea, do consider this radical surgery. How much you chop off? Well, that's really up to you. You could take as little as, say, five centimetres, right up to taking the plant down to a little stump. It's it's really up to you how you want the aesthetics of the plant to look. If you're the kind of person that likes to, to let live and do his own thing, that's absolutely fine too. I did hear back from Tracy that her plant it has sprouted quite nicely and is doing very well. So don't be afraid to prune your plants radically if they aren't doing what you want. Most plants will respond really well to pruning, particularly in the springtime and early summer when they are just itching to grow. If all, this all sounds like sacrilege, then, you know, you can just let your pilea do its thing. The babies will grow from the sides and also from the stem and all over the shop, to be quite honest. And that's absolutely fine. You'll end up with a healthy looking bush and that's all great. But as I say, don't be afraid of some radical surgery. Make sure you use a clean, sharp knife and clean that before you move on to any other plants. But other than that, you should find that it works really well. If you've got a question for On The Ledge podcast, do drop me a line on theledge at gmail.com and I will endeavour to help. I will be doing another Q&A special in the next few weeks. So get those questions coming in. And now it's time for our cam and gutation discussion with Dr. Polly Schiffman. Really glad to get Polly on the show to talk about this as a loyal listener and indeed a patron. It's a bit daunting speaking to her because, uh, as I say, she knows a heck of a lot more about plant biology than I do. But she was very generous with her time and gave excellent explanations of both these processes. So settle back and enjoy Leaf Botany Part 2. I'm Polly Schiffman. I'm a professor in the biology department at California State University, Northridge, which is in Southern California in the city of Los Angeles. And my expertise is um, plants and their ecology. I teach conservation biology and plant ecology and evolutionary biology and uh, just love plants. It has occurred to me that despite mentioning CAM and gutation regularly and indeed mentioning them in the Meet the Listener questions, not everyone might be as ginned up as we should be about what these things actually are. And that's where you've generously volunteered to come in and <laughs> enlighten us all. The first question I have to ask you, Polly, is, of course, the meet the listener question, cam or gutation, which is your favourite? Oh, by far, cam. No question. This is where we're going to get deep into the world of cam and gutation and find out what they are and why our houseplants are doing these things, which for some of them are, well, vital processes that are going on. Which should we start with? Let's start with CAM, seeing as that's your favourite. It's my favourite too. And it's an acronym short for crassulation. I can't even say it. Crassulation acid metabolism. But what does that actually mean? And what plants do this? Because this is not something that all plants can do. Where do we start with CAM? Yeah, so Crassulaceae acid metabolism. So the, it's named after a plant family, the Crassulaceae, which is what Crassula and Sedum and Echeveria are in. And um, it's also found in other plants, um, a lot of succulents, including cacti, but all sorts of other succulents as well. And bromeliads often are CAM plants, as well as a lot of orchids. So um, those those groups are, are um, mostly CAM. And then lots of other plant families have a few uh, species or uh, genera that um, have CAM as well. So it's kind of cool that it's a, a, a type of photosynthesis 
that has evolved um, repeatedly in um, plants um, independently in different branches of the plant family tree, you might say. So, you know, relatively unrelated groups of plants have converged on this really interesting way of solving a, a, a problem that they have in doing photosynthesis in stressful environments. Yeah, that's what I love about CAM is the fact that it's just they're so darn clever to have, <laughs> to have involved <laughs> this incredible way of dealing, as you say, with environments that aren't really that great. Tell us a bit more about how CAM actually works and what the acid bit means. Okay, well, maybe what I think I need to do is back up a little bit and give some background about like about photosynthesis first, because most plants aren't CAM. They do just regular old what botanists call C3 photosynthesis, which is, you know, something like, I don't know, 90% of all plants don't do CAM. And what plants normally do is they're taking water from the soil, usually, into their roots, and then the water moves up through the plant and out the leaves, usually through through these tiny, tiny holes called stomata. And the problem is that what plants face is this um, dilemma where their stomata need to be open because that's how they get carbon dioxide into their tissues so they can photosynthesize um, because carbon dioxide is one of the key ingredients for making sugars by photosynthesis. So they have to have their stomata open, these holes open to do that. But when the stomata are open, water can escape out of those same holes as water vapor evaporates out. And so on a hot day or in a, just a dry environment, they're losing water, but they still need carbon dioxide. And so they're kind of walking a knife's edge and the, the stomata can regulate the, the, the size of the opening and try and minimize that problem. But sometimes it's sort of insurmountable. So what cam plants do is they close their stomata during the hot time of the day or really during daytime and they open their stomata at night when it's typically cooler and the humidity of the air is, is somewhat higher. And so they avoid losing so much water. And that, but that, what that means is their photosynthetic process, the biochemistry is a little bit different than what most plants do because yes, they're capturing sunlight during the day, but they're not doing all of photosynthesis during daytime. Instead, what they do is they break it up into a daytime part and a nighttime part. At night, they're transforming carbon dioxide through a series of complicated biological, biochemical steps into an acid called malic acid. And that accumulates in their tissues and so as the night progresses, their tissues get more and more and more acidic. And then during the day, they transform that malic acid through some more complicated biochemistry into sugars. And during the night, the stomata are open, they're taking in CO2, they're using that through a complicated series of biochemical steps to make malic acid that they store in their tissues. And then during the day, they close their stomata, and so they're not losing all that excess water, and they transform that malic acid during the daytime into sugars. And so they can complete this process. It's just a, a more complicated uh, process than what most plants do. But most plants don't have to face um, the extremes of the limitations that cam plants do with very limited water living in deserts or as epiphytes, uh, where they don't have roots in nice moist soil. And so um, cam plants tend to be the ones that dry out and are at risk of losing too much water. I remember when I was doing a particular unit of my RHS course, um, the stomata are quite amazing the way they open and close. They've got these sort of sausage-like guard cells that that kind of open up and close. And it's if you, I will put a link in the show notes actually to to a diagram and a picture of that showing how it works because it is quite amazing how that operates the stomata opening and and shutting and just the fact that they're able to regulate themselves in that way is just so clever isn't it and when you're talking about cam plants do we have any idea whether cam developed alongside photosynthesis or whether photosynthesis developed and then cam was a later 
Mm. Evolution? Do we know that? Or is that <laughs> something we haven't yet discovered? Well, that's uh, something I actually, I'm, I'm going to give it a good guess. I'm not totally certain about this, but my hunch is, is that, and actually, I'm pre- actually now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure that C3, the regular way that plants photosynthesize, as what evolved first, because sometimes cam plants are partially C3 plants, and they can switch to cam when they need to, when the environment gets stressful, and then they switch back when they don't need to. Not all of them are so um, flexible, but some are. And uh, so I'm pretty certain that the regular form of photosynthesis, C3, evolved first, and then this kind of more complicated specialization happened later. There's another type of photosynthesis that we see most often in, in, in grasses called C4. So there's even more complicated photosynthesis going on in the plant world. Um, but they all have at their very core, this, this process that is essentially C3 with a whole bunch of other stuff tacked on to make it CAM or to make it C4. Uh, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, who knows what's going on behind the the surface of our plants? It's interesting with the CAM. I have seen people say that things like Sansevierias are good to have in bedrooms because of CAM, because it means that they're giving out oxygen at night. Now, <laughs> I suspect that the amount of snake plants you'd have to have in your bedroom to make any difference to the overall levels of oxygen would be ridiculous um but also these camp plants i mean they're not fast growers it's not like they're a tropical plant that's putting on loads of growth they're quite they're designed to be quite slow aren't they so yeah i i I found that idea quite funny but it's interesting how people have interpreted this idea of of plants uh, opening up their stomata at night and kind of twisted it to their own purposes. And if you think about it, the atmosphere that we breathe is about 20 something percent oxygen. So whatever little subsidy your um, sense of area provides overnight is going to be a tiny, tiny fraction compared to what's already there in the atmosphere all the time. Yeah, that's very true. It's yeah, I mean, it's lovely to have a sense of area in, in your bedroom if you want to. But yeah, just don't expect it to be somehow improving the <laughs> uh, the gas in your in your home like it's yeah it certainly can't hurt no well indeed i mean i'm sure it makes you makes you feel better generally that's human nature isn't it we want to surround ourselves with plants and we come up with all these reasons why we should other than just we like them and now let's hear from our other sponsor this week in the past few weeks i've been talking about bite away on the show And I've heard from some of you who've bought one for yourself and found that, yes, this little device works really well to take away the itch and swelling of insect bites within a couple of minutes. If you're not up to speed yet, well, the Bite Away is a battery operated device that uses concentrated heat directly onto the surface of a bite to deal with the discomfort they bring. So you just press the Bite Away, which is about the size of a chunky marker pen, onto the spot where you've been bitten by a bee or a wasp or a mosquito or whatever it may be. Press the button and the heat acts quickly to stop the itching and start to bring down the swelling. The Bite Away is compact enough to stick in your first aid kit when travelling or maybe you'll be putting it in your pocket when you're working in the garden or hiking. The Bite Away is available from Amazon UK for $26.99. Find out more at mybiteaway.co.uk that's mybiteaway.co.uk. So why is it that so many of the plants that use CAM are succulents? Yeah, that's really an interesting thing. So succulent plants, like all plants, have cells that have structures within them called organelles. And these are little subcellular places where the cell, the cell is doing various jobs. And one of the things that plant cells have are these structures called vacuoles. And vacuoles are essentially just a a container of water. And in succulents, they have a lot of vacuoles, very large vacuoles, full of water um, that they're storing. 
and that makes them juicy and, and succulent. And the really interesting thing about cam plants is, is that overnight when they're accumulating malic acid, the malic acid is being temporarily um, stored in those vacuoles. So the more succulent the plant is, the better able it is to accumulate malic acid. And so succulent plants tend to be, you know, uh, almost always cam plants. Uh, they're just really good at um, accumulating that malic acid and sequestering it overnight um, so it doesn't um, interfere with other processes that are going on in the cell. That's really interesting. I've always wondered quite what those vacuoles were up to, and now I know. And, of course, you know, um, some cam plants don't have particularly succulent tissues, and so their capacity for accumulating malic acid wouldn't be as great as something super juicy like a cactus or something like that. But all plants do have vacuoles, and so uh, within the cam plants, they all have some capacity to accumulate malic acid. Was Crassulacea the family that they studied, I wonder, why they called it crassulation acid metabolism? I guess they start found it in those plants first. Yes, in the early-ish 1800s, um, I can't remember this botanist's name off the top of my head, but for some reason he was tasting a member of the Crassulaceae, I think it was a bryophyllum, and noticed that it got increasingly more acidic tasting overnight. Now, why somebody would chew on a bryophyllum, I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, that led to, you know, the discovery of what was actually happening. Oh, that's so interesting. I mean, uh, it, yeah, I'd love to know what was going through their mind. But anyway, it's good that they did because it helped us <laughs> to understand uh, CAM. So there you go. That's how all great scientific discoveries begin. <laughs> Not Don't try this at home, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, I don't think it'll hurt you. I've never heard of a member of that family being poisonous, although, you know, maybe a few are. But it is a neat phenomenon. And I've had in, um, when I'm teaching, uh, done field trips where I've taken classes to the desert, and I've had students stay up overnight um, with pH paper, and you make a little wound into a cactus and test every hour. And you can see measurable changes in pH as the night progresses. And then as morning begins, it, it goes um, from the, the acidity more to more neutrality. So it's a really neat phenomenon. Oh, I'm going to have to get some pH paper now and try that out. <laughs> My husband's be like, what are you doing sitting <laughs> in the dark with your cactus? <laughs> And make sure you do it to, with one that is hopefully, you know, a little bit stressed in the middle of hot, the hot time of summer so it's not switched over to C3 because sometimes if they won't exhibit it if it's a, a you know, facultative cam photosynthesizer. Well, we've had a heat wave here, so it might just be the right time to try that out. And do, is there anything about cam plants? I mean, obviously, generally, we're treating... We're, you know, as everyone who listens to On the Ledge knows, you need to know where your plant comes from in order to give it the right care. But it doesn't impact on anything in terms of our care other than understanding perhaps that, you know, succulents don't want to be drowned in nu nu uh, humus rich uh, potting mix all the time. There's no other things that it imp impacts on in terms of how we care for them, is there? I, I don't think so. And especially since a lot of CAM plants are able to do um, regular photosynthesis if they don't need to be CAM. Now, not all of them. Some of them are more flexible than others. But I think mainly it's just making sure that plants don't have soggy roots if they're likely to be CAM plants because they're really not adapted to uh, living in a wet place and ha having constant you know, moisture. Um, but... I don't, I don't think so. I think if you just, you know, um, let them dry out in between waterings, they would be fine. Um, they grow slowly, but that doesn't, isn't so much a cam thing. I'm sure cam has, you know, some limitate, can limit how much plants can grow to some degree, but, um, 
but this, their slow growth is probably also just related to uh, resource limitations in general in the kinds of places they live. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're making the best of a of a not uh, nutrient rich environment. Most of, most of them aren't they? And uh, a very harsh world that you know it's it's absolutely astounding when you see I don't know lithops or one of these uh, mazems in South Africa. The conditions they're living in it's absolutely incredible that they can survive. So uh, it's obvious that CAM is is a really important mechanism for them and now we go to the opposite extreme which is gutation which is a a very different kind of process exhibited by a different set of plants and people get very alarmed when they see this happening to their plants and they don't know why why it's doing it where do we start with gutation um gutation is just simply uh, happening usually um, overnight. Um, most plants that aren't CAM, the vast majority of plants on earth, close their stomata at night. And so their roots are in the soil. And, and if the soil is moist, um, water is moving from the soil into the roots. And it's pushing water up through the roots, through the stems and out into the leaves. And it cr- exerts pressure, but the stomata are closed. And so water isn't going to evaporate out the way it would during the daytime. Instead, it kind of builds up, builds up, builds up. And it pushes out through these little water glands called hydathodes. And you get these little tiny water droplets, usually along the margins of leaves, or sometimes on little tips, or other um, little locations. I think of it as kind of a relief relief valve, um, allowing water to escape from the plant um, because it's moving into the plant um, just by diffusing from the soil into the roots. And there's a sort of continuous column, column of water being pushed up, up, up through the plant and out the leaves. And some people mistake um, gutation for dew, droplets of dew. But dew is when you have the condensation of atmospheric water on tips of leaves or other surfaces where this is actually water coming out of the plant itself. I mean, um, perhaps some people find gutation slightly problematic if water is dripping on, I don't know, soft furnishings. Is there any way of reducing gutation in your plants? Is it better to water in the morning rather than the evening? Well, I would say it's probably just maybe watering a little bit less. Of course, you know, this varies from plant to plant and some plants are going to do it no matter what. It also probably depends on the environment in where the plant is living and how humid or not humid it is, because if you have a lot of atmospheric humidity, you're probably going to have more um, water droplets accumulating and then dropping on the, the floor or on furniture than in a environment where there's low humidity, where it just evaporates. But I think if you have you know, a lot of water in the soil, then there's a, a, lo- a higher likelihood of gutation. But, but it really varies from plant to plant. And some plants don't really do it at all. And others do it all the time, or, you know, a lot, especially in the mornings. So I, mean, I haven't ever thought about watering at different times, but it might, might be better to water, you know, in the morning, so you have the plant has the entire day to handle that that additional water rather than watering at night where it's just sitting there overnight and the plant really can't take it up and use it it's not going to evaporate out the leaves i don't have that many aroids and i don't have many plants that gutate i don't know whether i'm just i don't know why my plants don't do it but i've got one um epipremnum that is really prone to doing it and it sits on my kitchen windowsill and every time i look at it it makes me think of the podcast (laughs) (laughs) And, and I don't have that many aeroids either. And maybe because I live in Southern California where our relative humidity is pretty low a lot of the time, it's, I almost never notice gutation on my houseplants. I've noticed it recently on squash growing in my garden outside, but I don't see it happening among my houseplants. So it, I, I imagine it varies from um, home environment to home environment a fair amount. And of course, from plant to plant. Great. And so we have nothing to fear from gutation. But it's interesting. It's been fascinating to me uh, hearing the Meet the Listener interviews to hear that people have really quite strong views about this, which one they prefer. And I'm very interested to know, to hear people's choices and to go, oh, okay, 
And I'm always slightly surprised when somebody goes for gutation, but there you go. That's just me and my personal preferences. Um, but that's, but that's really fascinating to get that insight. And hopefully that means that, uh, we're all upping our botanical knowledge a little bit further about, uh, about these two processes. Well, is there a third option I should introduce to the meet the listener option that we haven't talked about? I don't know. I can't think. Gosh. Well, I think there's, there's probably always something. One thing about gutation though is something I don't know for sure, but I would wonder if you have a plant that is really rampantly exhibiting gutation, it might, to me, if I were had that plant, um, I might um, hold back on watering a little bit because I would wonder if maybe the water is, there's too much water in the soil and it might be, you know, in the long run harming the plant. But I don't know that. And it probably varies a lot from plant to plant, you know, in terms of different species. Yeah, exactly. And I suppose it depends also whether the water is kind of parting and whether it's getting watered a lot, but it's in a really free draining mix. Therefore, it's not hanging around or whether, yeah, there's so many different factors. And I guess, as you say, it's so dependent on somebody's individual situation. And this is where, as we always say on the show, you know, you're observing your plants and what's going on. And by understanding these processes and, and how they're working, hopefully you'll get a sense of whether there's anything really wrong or whether your plant is just happily uh, doing gutation and is quite quite content with this lot yeah yeah i'm gonna to have to think if there's anything else we need to add to the the the, meet the listener question uh, suggestions on a, on a on an email from listeners please <laughs> what other processes have we missed that we should be including i suppose uh, i mean photosynthesis is of course the the mother of them all in terms of providing plants with uh, the ability to to grow and and be there in the first place but um there's there's so many other cool things going on in leaves that we need to be aware of and that's what's so fun about yes. doing this uh, leaf botany series and uh well there's a few more episodes hopefully upcoming where we're going to talk about different things with the other experts but but thank you very much for joining me polly that's been really fascinating okay well thank you for um being interested Thank you so much to Dr. Schiffman, a.k.a. Polly, for providing all of that great leaf botany information. And I know I say this every time, but please do click on the show notes link that you'll find in your pod app of choice, because there's lots of information on my website to further enhance your knowledge and give you some illustrations of what gutation looks like and so on. But now the question remains, gutation or cam? And Joe from Texas is here to give his answer in this week's Meet the Listener. Hello, I'm Joe. I live in Dallas, Texas, and I grew up gardening outside in the really arid mountains of Utah. And since moving to Dallas a few years ago, I have been living in apartments. I found that I really miss that connection to nature that you can get by gardening. So at that time, I really ramped up my indoor plants and currently have around 50 or so. Uh, I love ferns, palms, aeroids. Uh, On the Ledges really helped me learn so much more about plants. It has really deepened my appreciation for them, and especially now, I am so grateful to have my small indoor jungle. Question one. There's a fire and all your plants are about to burn. Which one do you grab as you escape? I would save my Norfolk pine from the fire. It is such a gorgeous plant with a really unique style. I feel it really adds a lot to the room. I use it as a Christmas tree. (laughs) I think a lot of people seem to find this plant really difficult, but as long as it gets enough light and regular watering in kind of a sandy soil, I find it does just fine. The only thing that would be a problem with saving this from the fire is it is so big it would make for a very slow escape. Question two. What is your favorite episode of On the Ledge? I loved the Hilton Carter episode. Uh, I loved learning how he styles the plants, how he gets that really jungly look in the house. Uh, I have bought some of his books ever since that episode, and I've really been enjoying the process of styling my plants in my home. Question three. Which Latin name do you say to impress people? 
Epipremnum Penatum is my favorite Latin name. I think it's really fun to say. Uh, I do like the common name as well, Cebu Blue Pothos. Um, I just really like these plants. They're super low maintenance, attractive. I think we could all use more plants like that. Question four, crassulation, acid metabolism, or gutation? I think for me, I would definitely take gutation over cam. Uh, those lovely drops on the leaves just look so beautiful. And tell me if I'm keeping it happy. Um, I love seeing them in the morning. Uh, it's just a nice thing to wake up to. Question five. Would you rather spend £200 on a variegated monstera or £200 on 20 interesting cacti? I... I think 200 pounds is a lot of money for a single plant, so the interesting cacti would seem the logical choice. However, I grew up in a desert. I've had more than one run-in with spines on a cactus, and I don't feel the need to revisit those experiences. I have always loved jungly tropicals, and I think I would go with that Monstera for sure. Plus, I do really love a big plant that makes a statement. Thank you, Joe. I hope the rest of Texas forgives you eventually for not picking cacti over an aroid. Only joking. You can pick whatever you like. <laughs> Thanks very much to Joe and to Polly, my guest this week. I'll be back next Friday. Bye. Right. Now, where did I leave that pH paper? The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, The Encouragement Stick by Dr. Turtle, and Chiefs by Jazar. The ad music was by the Heftone Banjo Orchestra with the tracks Whistling Rufus and Dill Pickles. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit my website janeperone.com for details.